Hey guys, I'm Barb and welcome to episode eight of Creators Campfire. If you're new here, then this is a live streamed podcast where I interview all sorts of creative people. So entrepreneurs, content creators, side hustlers, and general aspiring talent to find out more about what they do, why they do it, and how they do it. So for those joining us live, we'll be taking questions throughout. So if you do have anything you want to ask tonight's guest, then please just drop it in the comments and we'll get to it as, as we go. So tonight, we have Tucson Ulysses joining us tonight. He is a photographer and artist by trade, but he has recently published a children's book, the first of a, in a series that he's, he's um, working on. Um, and we're going to find out more uh, about that book and his background. So guys, please welcome Tucson. Hey. Hey. Um, good to see you all the way from the, uh, from the UK. We're giving you some Philadelphia lo love. So he used to call the city of quality love. And the current mayor changed the name to the, to the city of sisterly love. So from the, uh, from the city of sisterly love, I would like to... Welcome you to, to our home. Thank you for being one of your guests. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me on the show tonight. Um, so, Tucson, first and foremost, you're obviously a photographer by trade and an artist and have a keen passion for fashion. That was not a, an intended rhyme. Um, can you <laughs> first just, do you want to just introduce yourself, give us a bit of background about yourself, tell us a bit about your journey? <laughs> I um, mean, uh, an, an illustration can be very uh, can be very complex for me, but I, I always like to say that I am uh, I am a thinker more than anything else. It's not even uh, a writer or anything like that. Uh, some in my book call me um, uh, a Renaissance soul, the Renaissance man, but as a whole, I think I see myself more really as a as a thinker. Because I think um, if we if we really want to um, about the words of uh, philosopher, French philosopher Wendy Descartes, you know, I think therefore I am. And uh, if you want to follow the words, follow the words of King Salomon, he says, you know, as a man think, as a woman think, so is he, so is she. So I like to believe that I'm more fully of a, of a thinker who happens to have a, a love affair for photography and also who really uh, admire um, fashion and also you know, who, who really uh, like to. Uh, sprinkles people on inspirations. That's lovely. <laughs> um, I, I very much like that. So if we go back a little bit then on, on your path, how did you initially get into photography? Uh, photography, the love began uh, before I left my country, Haiti, um, in, in uh, February or January 98, I believe. What's the first time I bought in love? give me a, a camera to hold and he was, uh, he wanted me to take a picture for him, my sister. And then I took this picture, but that's something that was very fascinating. When you look into the viewfinder and that little grain of photography that remind you of film noir, remind you of the very beginning of photography and film and the concept of really the shutter and really to frame the subject. And there's something about the grain of the look inside the viewfinder and in framing the subject that spoke to me, that gave a sense of very um, um, power in that moment. But know that the moment you, uh, you press that shoulder, that's become um, history. That's where I begin the process. And, uh, and then from that time, he would really, um, come back and say, hey, you know, when you're taking the pictures, make sure you cut my feet here, you cut my hair, you know, you know, customize arm. So we're making all the processing and all the critics that he was being uh, shared with me. And and then before I left the country, I was able to document the last month before I left Haiti with my classmates and everything. And and, uh, and I share with you that I broke his camera uh, before I left the country. So now I felt um, I felt um, so bad, but he ended up mad my sister. So I guess uh, I'm safe there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. The world has a w funny way of working out sometimes. <laughs> um, um, okay, so so you've got this love of passion, uh, this love of photography from from really early on. Then it's, it's almost like it's it's meant to be. But at the same time, you also was it that you were interested in fashion at the same time, or you actually became interested in fashion through the process of photography? Um, when you go up in Haiti, going to church is something that you do every uh, every Sunday. And uh, have the blessing that 
my mom's living here, always really sends clothes, uh, uh, very nice clothes for us in, in Haiti. But also the art in Haiti is very vibrant. So very early on, you see all these street artists, you know, uh, art, you know, I'm talking about mural art uh, on the street. You're talking about really canvas done by Haitian artists. As you know, Haiti is really well known for its art around the globe. And, and some even all call us you know, the epicenter of art really uh, in the world, especially when it comes to, uh, to the new world in America. So the, the concept of the color was always there. And Haiti do have a sense for fashion while you would be in Haiti because um, it's a country that has, um, in the North was a kingdom with King Henry. In the South of Haiti was the president. President Pétion, which is very rare in two places that have two different forms of government in a small little island. And so you, you see a sense of the world because um, I learned stories in my family that one, some of my family members did work for uh, for King uh, King Henry in the, in the palace, palace in Soussi, who built the citadel in Haiti. Um, so that sense of the fashion, you see that in the family, you see uh, your uncle, you know, who was a congressman, a speechwriter, you see them dressing up every time, every day uh, to go to work. So that is really, I think, automatically is engraved in you because what you see has a big impact on you, who you are as a person. I think that's basically without sense. I don't see myself really in that fashion world. It's just something I do for fun and that my friends and my clients happen to enjoy. So I'm getting another alert here uh, because there's a big storm going on here right now, guys. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's where it, that's, that, I think that's where it started, that's where it began with. It. It's just the environment that I was in, and then I really love putting colors together. Yeah, I guess um, it's it's one of those things that sounds like it almost goes hand in hand. Though to be a photographer, you need to be able to see that kind of beauty in things and, and understand how to take the pictures of of certain things. Um, do you yeah, have... and I will add I will add to that. That is um, the actual photography. Uh, the actual picture that you're working on, when you press the shutter, it's the last piece, but the, the, the photograph itself, it's already took way before you press the shutter. This is why when I talk to my client, I, I, and I share with them that the mise-en-scene, we have to talk about the mise-en-scene, we have to pick the mise-en-scene, we have to pick, I have to pick what you're gonna wear before I even say I'm gonna sign this contract. Because what you wear, the mise-en-scene, is the photograph. It's not really pressing the shoulder. It's the last thing we do, but the making of it. So there's the language of colors, how colors really communicate, and how, as a viewer, it's going to make you feel. And what is the what is the capacity? What is the the, the complexion the skin you, your skin have? What some of the color that will complement that? That we have to speak. To, we have to speak to those first, and then pick that place, pick that means. I'm saying, what is the story you want to create, and from that phase, and then we snap the shoulder, snapping the shoulder. Otherwise, you know, everyone has a phone, so everyone can see the photo. <laughs> it's true. Everyone can be a photographer, but not a real one. <laughs> okay. Um, so you've obviously got this background in photography. You've got an eye for art and fashion. Um, but I guess that, that journey has kind of taken a bit of a tangent in that you have now kind of moved slightly into um, writing a children's book. So yeah. where did the inspiration for that come from? What was the reason for doing it? And, and how did you kind of, in your head, make that connection between one and the other? Oh, I think we're frozen, guys. Um, anybody is watching, it's definitely frozen. Um, See if we can get Tucson back. Um, so Tucson is currently in Philadelphia and they are in the middle of a storm. So it's probably not that surprising. Let's hope everything is okay. I think potentially the internet might have just cut out or the storm is wreaking a little bit of havoc. Um, let's see what we can do. In the meantime, if there are any uh, questions, from you guys, anyone listening that just wants to say hi, feel free to pop them in the comments box, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube, um, and we will definitely get to them. Uh, I don't quite know 
where he has gone. Let me just Okay guys, uh I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take a brief pause there and we will uh come back shortly when we get Tucson back. Uh stay tuned. We'll be back. Okay, guys, I think we are back. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, let, let's get to hang on, Tucson. Just one second. Let's add you back in. Uh, here we go. Right. Sorry, guys. Tucson oh. is back. Uh, yes, I'm that's back. what happens yes. when you stream in a storm. So be prepared. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. Everything is okay. We're good. Yeah. No, every, okay. everything is good. The rent is a little lighter here. But, um, <laughs> Okay. But that's not any heavier than that, so sorry about that. Good. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> cool. Right. Uh, let's get, let's get back into it as long as everything's okay. Um, so uh, we were talking about making the transition or having the idea of um, making your first children's book. So it was more around what the thoughts were in your mind of what was going through your head at this point and why you decided to do what you did. Um. The book is um the book came after Haiti. I got this t-shirt when I was in Haiti. If you could see well, it says Songe 2010. So Songe means remember 2010. So that was when the earthquake really happened in Haiti. And at that time, if you remember, everyone were trying to rush to see what they can do um, to help the country. And and the world witnessed a level of massive love, compassion, kindness, uh, empathy that a lot of us didn't know that was really exists inside of us. And we see the humanity of the entire universe at the macro level, and which was very hard to comprehend, to, to experience. Um, but I was living it while I was really in Haiti. So three days later, and I decided that I want to go home to help my country. But not only that, my grandma left United States, uh, the months before, for vacations, went back home. And then uh, we're not able to hear back from her uh, at all. So two things basically come to mind. So I was just graduating from college. 
And I decided that I need to go to see if my grandma survived. So she was 95 years old. Um, she raised me since uh, I was three months old uh, boy because my mom was really traveling around, around here as a travel nurse. And that's the first thing I had to do. You know, I need to know if my grandma survived and, uh, and what can you do to see if we can bring her back in the state. And I also know as a photographer, I know I have a superpower as a photographer. I know I can capture as images, but I also know that the images that I saw were coming into um, CNN, to BBC News, international news, there were a lot of desperations, but something was missing. It was the spirit of the Haitians, the community that I know that raised me. That piece was missing tremendously, and I know that I had, I had I had a duty to do to go and serve my country. So I grabbed my camera, uh, met with some of the few people, so few people from church, and then I went down. So the mission actually, to make a long story short, we were actually shooting a documentary uh, about the earthquake in Haiti. So this is the 10th year anniversary. We're still in post production of that film, and then. As I'm looking into it, I say, wow, we cannot finish this film. What else can we do to get the story out about Haiti? And then the book idea I just clicked. I said, what well, if I put this into a book instead? I don't have the funding to finish this film. Doesn't mean that the movement, the story we're sharing need to stop. Doesn't have to happen. Even though I do a few clips about the documentary and then the story of the book really click very, very, very early on. So the book really take a life of itself. When I see it, what some of the girls were doing inside the church, outside the church in their community, how they really stood behind me to give me, um, uh, really assist me to find the funding that I need to go back home. When we're talking about... Oh no, we might have lost Toussaint again. Oh, we're not doing well today. And for me, we're that back. was a good back, yeah. For me, we're that back. was an eye. <laughs> That was an eye-opening moment to see nine-year-old girl, eight-year-old girl, ten-year-old girl understand the compassion, the complexity, the complexity of a, uh, a country that is really on its knees, you know, really um, desperately needs service, desperately needs compassion. And those girls, they saw two photographs that I took, and those two photographs really spoke to her, and she said that I really need to do something. I can help you. Um, with funds to go find your grandma and to really help your country. So a few things happened there. I want to see that happen. A, she was in an environment where her parents know it was important for her to give her funding to someone that she can relate to. That was the first thing. So parenting was very important. Um, and and uh, in the second phase, the photograph that I took, that I know something was missing, spoke to her at that level. It moved her. So when I say that, that's one of the superpowers. That's the power for images, what it has. And then uh, at this piece, and the, she would really come to meet with me. I met her after a church service and didn't really make much of it. You know, kids like that, they probably do raise $100, $200, and give you something, and you move on. But there was something else happened. That was not what she was interested in doing. She, uh, she, she did the first fundraiser. The first one that she did in open house at her base, three o'clock, invite people you know, after church. Goal was to raise three hundred dollars, and uh, in the first in the first thirty minutes, she she scratched her goal by three hundred dollars to five hundred dollars, and at the end of the night, she ended up raising uh, I think it was close to fifteen hundred dollars. So now imagine if we have someone to match her goal. We didn't have someone to match it dollar for dollar. If we had that. But for, for really a, a nine-year-old girl to bring her team together, and they were making bead jewelry, like bracelets. Uh, they were making uh, uh, even necklaces. That's what she has. She knows she can make uh, uh, beads bracelets, and she knows she can create those things people would like to wear. That was a superpower that she has. And I'm watching her bringing her team together, her parents, when you show up to the house, the whole house is like, it's like, so what's, what the heck? Like, earthquake happened here, guys? With everything going on this table, we see everybody were making bids. Mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, the, the neighbor next door. The house was like massive, and it was midnight. Everybody said, oh, we got to finish those. 
in that process, that was the piece that I said, gosh, if these girls get it, how come the, the United Nations, how come the Red Cross, how come the United States, how come French, how come Canada does not get it? If you really want to serve this country, you have to put the power in the hand of the people. You cannot, if you don't trust the Haitian community to make choice for their own people, then you're not doing anything. You're actually really hurting the process. The fact that she gets the point, she knows that she has to give me the money and I can really allocate the fund as I see it fits into the country. In this case, to go find my grandma. That was the message I think the world needs to see that message that a nine year old guy a girl get it, but you guys still doesn't get it. 300 years later, 400 years later, you still do not get it. And the reason was simple, because your heart is not into it. You hear with it for your own gain, for your own benefits. But this, but this nine-year-old girl is showing you up, all of you. She just gave all of you an F for the efforts in Haiti, all of you. And that, that's the underdog spirit. That's the Rocky Balboa spirit from Philadelphia. This girl gets it, and she gives them that knockout punch. I said, you got a girl, and the other girl, we're going to make a book on this. Not only beside the film, we're going to make a book. So we're going to document what you are doing here, and we're going to let the world know that there's a difference between help and service. Help, it's me in the picture. It's everything about me, 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 moi, moi, moi. Service is you, be, you willingly become a slave. You're going to serve someone, and you're willing to step back and get no credit at all. That's the difference between an adult and a kid. The kids get it. They're invincible. They can really smash the world. The adult, we have all the doubt that you could imagine. We don't get things done. <laughs> As it takes a universe, it takes an eternity for us to get things done. And that's who it was. I was very fascinated by that. So I want to talk to other adults, but using kids. I think we've lost Toussaint again. Toussaint, if you're there, you've frozen again. We're not having much luck tonight. Uh, will he come back? Let's give it a second. Uh, but to those that are listening, what an amazing story. Um, this nine-year-old girl doing everything and well, it just it just shows you the difference. He's Tucson is right. The difference between um, what goes for a child's mind that's very pure, and maybe an adult who has all these doubts, put all these worries, and second guesses themselves, and just spends too much time thinking rather than doing. Um, and I also like how Tucson's made that differentiation between help and service. Um, because he's right, it's very easy to um, just donate money, I suppose, and say you've you know you've done your job, but to actually go and serve those people is very very different. Um, I'm just gonna. I'm not sure we're gonna get him back anytime soon. Let's. Um, let's see if he comes back. Uh, uh, we've, we've lost him. Okay. Um, yes, Ryan, I completely agree. Um, kids' minds, they, they don't get caught up with other things. Uh, they just see right and wrong. Um, oh. Oh, oh, oh. We have two songs back. We're not doing too well tonight, two songs. <laughs> we are not doing too well, my friend. That's, okay. the of, that's the speed of the earthquake following us, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, look, I'm glad you're back. And what an incredible story. I was just saying, I love the two things you pulled out there. One is the fact that there's the, the, the children see the world in a different way and, and don't get caught up in the things like you said that adults do. And secondly, the difference between health and service. And I think you made a really good point there about what the difference is. Um, and, and Ryan was just also agreeing that um, kids, they don't, they just see right and wrong. They don't, they don't kind of 
get caught up in all the other stuff. So um, no, it's a it's an amazing story, um, and I can understand why that's kind of triggered you and gone. No, hang on, this this book is is the way to go. And was it the fact that it was this young girl that was doing it? What made you want it to be a children's book? Because obviously the viewpoint of a child, like we've just agreed, is different to those of an, of an adult. So actually the message that you want to get out is to the kids who can then grow up and make the difference. Is that Was that the idea? Yes, that's the idea. Uh, I had a professor in college who's also in the cover of the book. And the one thing she really talked about in uh, communication class, in America, if you really want someone to care about something you're talking about, uh, two things, there are two categories of people three category of creatures that American will listen to. Kids, if it's a kid's story, they're gonna, gra they're gonna gravitate towards it. If it's a story about um, elderly, they're gonna heavily interested. And if there's pets in the story, they're gonna be interested. Anything else, forget about it. <laughs> so I said, well, I have kids. My grandma, she's almost 100. So I got two of the two pieces over there. I don't really have pets in the combination, I got two. Out of three, so I think we have something that really will make people really interested. So, in that how, we are when you're really writing this piece for your audience, uh, as that story you're trying to reflect, you need to know to figure out what's going to make your audience move. What's exactly the piece that's going to make your audience so interested in the story and in an idea that you want to share that you want to broadcast with the world. Um, I have this idea in my head, particularly all I really want people to listen to my message, really respond to my message. But if what I'm going to gravitate is what the message I'm going to I'm going to share is not coming to a medium that understands the culture that we in, and the one that makes that culture move, then it's going to be very problematic for me to really reach them where they are. So it's important to reach them to reach them basically where they, a photograph reach you where you are, a music reach you where you are, a food reach you where you are. Hopefully uh, a podcast will reach you where you are, things that really interested us who, where we are. And that's why in so many ways that life is about. I dare you really, if you just really work, wake up early in the morning and then you happen to be someone who's moving from Ohio, selling your house in Ohio, you're very crazy. You move into Florida because you want to open a coffee shop. Hello, Ryan. When you have that cup of coffee, that cup of coffee meets you where you are. In that morning, in the afternoon, you want that cup of coffee. That coffee meets that trust that you have wherever you are. And I think your message, the book, whatever the, uh, the piece you're trying to create, it could be um, coding, you know, it could be um, a Western, to be the love of fashion. It could be in the issue of really policy making. So that those policy have to meet the audience. You really want to change their life in a way they are. So I, I, that's, that's what was were very interested in. KB was able to embody that story. And that story that we we're looking at, she met me where I was. And I was able to meet my grandma okay, where she was. So it's very important to know in that process, hey, when you're looking at your story, who's going to be that audience? We know who that audience could be. I know I want to be uh, kids. And I also know that in the background, I don't know, I really want to talk to Ryan as a father. I really want to talk to Ryan's wife as a mom. Because it can, be, it can be very problematic to talk to Ryan, to ask Ryan to do something, to ask the parents to do something. But when the kids is asking them to do something, they're going to do it. And the parents who basically doesn't want to do that, that for their child, that's the parents who basically have to look into the marriage. Um, Am I a douche or am I really a person? So <laughs> you need to know who you are really in that, in that context. So we know these cultures love their kids so much. They love their pets more than they love their kids, which I understand. Um, uh, as a parent, you, want, uh, you, know, you, you understand that. Then, then you, you, speak, uh, you speak to the pets. So we have, uh, we have a bulldog. We have a pink bulldog that we adapt into our campaign. When we go through some stories, we call him Paul. <laughs> He's actually an English bulldog. <laughs> I we name him the Haitian bulldog. <laughs> we paint him pink. We take him into the uh, this, uh, out with us when we do book signing and book reading because the survey show that the survey show when there's a stuffed animal or animal in the room, it cool down the temperatures for the kids. They more really lean gravitate. So 
Yeah, so in so many ways, that is what we are we were about. We see KD has that. So what how do we bring this message? How do we breathe life through that message? Yeah, so you, so okay, so that makes a lot of sense. So so you've got this idea now and you you know how you want to play it, you've got the story, you've got you've got your why. How do you then because this is obviously your first book. So how do you physically go about? So I, I guess I could sit here and go, I want to write a book, but that doesn't mean it's ever going to see the light of day. So what's your kind of process in, in doing that? And how long did it take to go from almost idea to, to getting the book out there? The idea of a book came out very quick. And when you really write into species, a lot of time you can you could do it really overnight. It's the post-production that's going to take you a lot of time. Um, so I met with a friend of mine, and I, he was also attending the same church. I said, it's exactly what you want. He said, really, I want to have I'm going to start with the concept for you. I see what you are doing. He started the whole concept and basically gave me a first world draft. So basically, I have a ghost really working with me, uh, ask me a few questions, and he presented me something. What he presented me, then I go at it and tweak it and finish the whole piece. So there are, there are different ways you could do that. Now, the back of the book, where it's uh, that are more focused on the adult materials, those are the one I, I um, completely sit down and I write all those pieces. But the actual really story of it, because I was so much into the story, it is a little bit more challenging for me to write the story. So right away, that's why I asked a friend that was close to say, hey, ask me those questions and then get the story out of me. So he was able to do that, then I edit the piece. So Ghostwriter is a very big important thing that I will do when I work with. So I, I've got to be able to find a few ghostwriters who can really work with me. I'll give them the skeleton of my book, of my story. Basically, a lot of time I will divide the chapters for them, the chapters I'm thinking about, and then they will go about and they develop all this concept. And then when they send them back to me, then I tweak them, 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 I add things, take those away. And then I... I thought we might have made it to the end, but it's happened again. Um, let's hope this is a small one, guys. Let's give it a minute. Um, okay, for those that have, have joined partway through, oh, are we back? Is it a false alarm? Yes, Ryan, exactly. Live podcasting. Probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, so while, while Tucson gets um, back in, uh, for those that are joining partway through, uh, we are speaking to Tucson Ulysses tonight. Um, he is a photographer and artist by trade. He grew up in Haiti, um, but within the last couple of years, he published his first children's book, and he was just talking about the idea and the why um, for why he's done that. And we are now, hopefully, when he comes back, talking about the process of physically publishing a book. Because I guess, well, well, for me at least, it's it's not something that I'm fully aware of in terms of the process. Um, so hopefully we'll get to Saw back very soon. Uh, okay, I will. All right, guys, so you don't have to listen to me ramble. We will be uh, right back. Let's, let's take a mini break. If I had ads to show you, I'd show you some ads. But in the meantime, uh, oh, actually, we might be okay. Hello. Hey. Are there's we okay? <laughs> yes, there's a game in here called Lago. Lago okay. makes it I'm chasing you, you're chasing me. Oh. Right, you're playing Lago. <laughs> we are definitely playing Lago. <laughs> All oh, right. Uh, anyway, you're back. That's an important thing. <laughs> yeah. um, third time lucky, I think. Um, so where, where were we? We were talking about post-production of your book. Yes. Yes. Um, and the importance of ghost writers yes. uh, in the process. And um, 
I guess I was just going to follow on from that with talking about the artwork in the book um, and how that goes about. So how much of this could be a potentially really stupid question, so I apologise, but how much of the artwork was you and how much was somebody else? Um, on the words of the book or? Uh, so the, the, the actual artwork, so. Oh, um, the actual artwork. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I, I would say that I have a very, uh, a teacher from Haiti, and he always says that a question can never be stupid. And he says your answer could be stupid, but the question can never be stupid because the person is coming from a different world. You don't know what they don't understand. So your, your response to it can be stupid, but the question itself, but what might be obvious to you is not obvious to someone else. Uh, so I think it's a very good question now. <laughs> Now, the artwork itself, I always work with uh, illustrators because, you know, if you don't, if you don't illustrate, you need to really work with someone. And I go to a few, uh, few friends who understand. But in, uh, I, while you're writing the book, I basically write what this whole image should be pages, what I want those to be. And then the illustrators go out and create exactly what I want to be, what the artwork really wants to be. I mean, if I had it my way, a lot of things were really changed, but especially the wardrobe and Oh, Tucson, you're jumping. The next one was that. I don't know if you can hear me, but if you can, you're jumping How about now? Um, yeah, I can hear you. I can, I can hear you with a while. Okay, well, that, that's a start. I can hear you with a while. <laughs> um, I think you're okay now. So we're talking about the artwork. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so, you, so you have some illustrators that you work with to make the process easier. So we've got, mm -hmm. so in terms of your process, you've, you've obviously, it's your idea, you know exactly what you want from it. You've got a ghostwriter to come in to help you put the pictures onto the pages and you've got illustrators to come mm -hmm. and bring that to life. So you effectively have yes. your book, um, but how do you publish it? Because in my mind, and it's very old school, and I, I imagine mm -hmm. it's, it's changed a lot and you can self-publish and all these kind of things. But um, in, in my mind, you need to get a book deal and you need to go and, and get someone to publish it. But what, how does that actually work? Yeah, well, be, before that, you need, to, you need to remember that finding a great illustrator for children's book, it's everything. It's everything. <laughs> the, I mean, the children will forget you, will forgive you and the words you have in it, they might not make sense. But the pictures, it's everything why well, you say the picture was a thousand words <laughs> so you really have to be very smart on what, how you would be describing how you're making those characters come to life inside that book that's really going to connect to the parents is really going to connect to the child so you've got to have an amazing uh, illustrator and that's where you're gonna you, that's where you're going to spend a bunch chunk of your money it's gonna spend into an illustrator because they can go from anywhere from hundred dollars to a slide to all the way to five or eight hundred dollars a slide to so how good how big that they are. I was very blessed and fortunate I find someone who was willing to do it for me at the level I think twenty or twenty five because they believe in the story so much. What was going on in Haiti, that was one of the services they want to really help Haiti. They want to serve Haiti at that level. They want to use their strength, their skills as a superpower to make a difference. When I say that, your skills, your strengths are making a big difference. This is a guy who's an illustrator. You may not think this is the last thing he will need. How can you serve and as an illustrator for a place you just have a big earthquake? But he's making that story come to life. And now we have that story today. We are educating parents and children around the globe the importance of service now they're gonna now they see Haiti in a different light. A light where Haiti is serving them. Haiti is talking to them how to become a better human being, how to become a better person. So yes, yeah, so you have to raise funding to make it to your illustrator. So I need a I did an Indiegogo campaign and I I asked them to um, give me a few images uh, at no cost. Uh, the cover and idea of the cover, three, four images. And that gave me a story that I can build it and I can really ask some of my friends and strangers if they really believe in the story you know, to really help us with the funding. So we're able to raise 75% of our funding to an Indiegogo campaign. And after the campaign is over, somebody has came in and they add the entire 25 and more percent that we needed to finish the book. So I know uh, the different uh, backers and I really give them something very special 
So you have to make, you really have to make the prize you're going to give in this book, make it very intrigued that your backers really want to be part of this project because there are people out there, that's all they're looking for. They want, A, they want to serve and B, they want their name to be attached to something that's feels bigger than them, larger than life. And those people are out there. They are they looking for projects. They're looking for people like me. They're looking for people like you. So you expose your story and move it to the world. So tell your story. Be authentic about it. Because your story is the most important piece that you have. Do not really underestimate, undermine what story could be. And if the story, they connect to your story, then it's a game changer. Now, how do you make them connect to your story? The way that you make your, own, your audience connect your story to give you the funding that you want, you need to tell them your why. That is the most important piece in the entire universe that I learned from Simon Sinek. Who he did a uh, TED talk talking about the power of why. Know your why. And in that piece, I frame every book that I ever purchased in, the documentary we're working on, I frame everything about my why why I'm doing this, why I'm interested in this. If your why is identified with my why, that's it. Game is over because it's no longer about me. Because you see yourself in me. You see yourself in that story. It doesn't matter what it, how much you are asking. You're going to come about because it's not about me. It now it became your vision. It became your passion. It became your lifestyle. So make sure that you frame your pieces. And that's not just for bookmaking. That's for it. Everything in life. You're trying to build a ministry, tell people why you want to do it. You're trying to have a car shop, tell people why you want to do it. You want to have a podcast, let people why you want to have this podcast. If they identify with them, you share that message to different platform, video, text, audio, whatever it is. Then they're going to meet you basically where you are. So we know we have to do that to really share our vision, share our, uh, share our passion. And then people continue really to share the message and then continue to do that and that to make it faster. Now, another piece that I did in raising the funding, before I do the end of campaign, I was trying to do some research. How can I make the campaign go really a little crazy? So before I post everything, I contact a few of my friends that I know who will be interested in this project. Sometimes you see people posting on Facebook or on Instagram I'm raising money for my birthday for this charity. When you're looking at the amount being raised, it's zero. No, I'm not going to give money to that. It's to say zero dollar. So no one's ever given money to it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be the first person, no. Um, there are a few of us who really want to be the first one to do what I, what I did, I contact people that are not interested in what I do. Now, I need to raise $10,000. If the people I'm contacting to I already raised $7,000 in the bank. Even before I post this, uh, this piece live, I'm sitting very pretty. Automatically, Indiegogo is going to take this project. you are going to move it up to the page. Kickstarter is going to take this project. you are going to move it into that page. So before I post it, I say, hey, Bab, how much money can I put you down for? All right, put me down for 250 pounds. There you go. Put you to 250 pounds. And the moment we post in the next 24 hours, in the next 10 minutes, first hour, so, what? Why don't you just it? Look at this, how it's been funding so quick. Now, they're paying attention to that. They see how the algorithms will really be moving on that. They're going to continue to really give you more push that you need. Every candidate campaign do the same thing. Someone's really uh, building um, uh, Jeff Bezos before he built Amazon. It's the same way. Meet with all the different investors to see who's interested before we do the launch. So, in your vision, in your passion, things you're trying to really work on. It's the same thing I would advise you to do, to see who. Sometimes you, you are at a place where you don't have that luxury, that luxury of your friends. And not your network it could be anywhere in, in North Philadelphia, like, definitely be anywhere in the UK where you have no connection. You're new to the town as a whole. You don't, have, you don't know anyone at all. That's when the power of your storytelling is important. But also look into your toolbox. What is it that one thing that you're very good at? So are you good at making people feel good? Build that on what you're very good at, what you're very exceptional at. So what you are doing is you're taking your friends, you're taking your enemies to your own battlefield. You're taking them to your own home court advantage. 
if you're very good at doing a, a podcast, take them into the in the environment of really producing and creating a podcast as a, as a as a vehicle to um to raise that funding or to raise those grant that you that you want. So that's the first place you can start. If you came into this universe, you don't know anyone. The thing is, we all we all fly for the same thing: trust, you know, passions, love, music, food. As human, we all have the same means, we all have the same means. Have different way of getting there, but we all have the same. So play to that, play to the skill that you have, play to the advantage that you have. And a lot of the time, the piece that you underestimate the most is a lot of time are the one that can really bring. So don't leave anything on the table. If you don't think they might like, they might not like this music. Like, you know, Gary talked about that a lot, Gary V. He's like, I said, no, the thing you're sitting on, you think you, you don't like, it's probably the piece. That's gonna really make it and break it for you. So release the piece, let the world be the judgment, you know? Enjoy it, just really enjoy the process. So yeah, so before we get to that illustration, that's what that's how I was able to really raise that funding, get my friends together, see who's really behind me first, and then how much they were willing to give me. I create the page. And one thing I didn't know then that I would add after watching Gary V is I will add next time the next book we're gonna do, the next two books. We're going to ask the audience, I'm going to ask you Beth, what do you want? What do you want as a good purpose? Tell me what it is, and I'm just going to add it, and that's it. And how much you would be willing to really, uh, give me for that purpose? So ask your uh, your audience what they might want to see, what type of credit they might want to receive. And then from that point on, and you see, you're sitting good. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And I, I like that, getting your backing early and before, because it's a very good tip for people. Um, so just 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 on that, I guess uh, back to the publishing question. How so? You how do you physically then publish this book that you have? You've got the backing, you've got the product. How do you then get it into the hands of people? Yeah, publishing is going to be very easy. I went to a couple of publishing show. A few of them were a couple uh, Christian uh, publishing show. I was amazed to see um, none of the big publishers didn't really pick on on the story. Um, so I would expect that they were going to take in one with it. And uh, that didn't happen. I had one that was really interested in it. But in the process of how much money you have to make them and see what you're going to get in return, <laughs> it, wasn't worth it. <laughs> it wasn't worth it, the money. Because when I learned, I would say, hey, really, they don't, they don't really give you that much support that you are expecting that they're going to provide on the table. Only a very few, very small amount of artists that would create this book and then you make really a million for it. But first thing you have to remember as artists, we write books because we care about something, but it's not because you're gonna make money off of it, no. You, you write it because there's something very passionate about, you want the world to uh, uh, you know. So when I didn't get anything from all this publishing company that I went to, I said, well, if you're not interested in it, I can still make it myself. So I did my research. I know um, Amazon have a really self-publishing uh, platform. And if I say publish it with Amazon, I know I can really have it done in a day if I need to, in two or three days, in a week if I really need to tap on uh, um, most. So we went through the Amazon process. And then at least I still own everything in my book. Even though when you own everything to your book, now Amazon doesn't make it available automatically to Barnes & Noble. So we learned that in that process. So if I want them to be available to Barnes & Noble in so many places, I was going to have to own the right to the book, which I didn't want to have. I didn't want them to own the right to the book. So I have to really make sure I really own everything really when I said because it's a, um, it's a series. So we, we didn't go that well. So we went to Amazon to set production with them. They make the process very easy. It's not too expensive, almost free, I would say. You just purchase the EIN number. Once you purchase that EIN number, and then you give your book a title to the Amazon, they tap the process. It, it's very easy for you to submit the book and working with my illustrator to continue to really tweak the size of the Amazon. So the, this piece was the hardest thing because, you know, it might fit here and then you're looking at it again, they submit it, they would check it because something wasn't working. But one thing I learned, they keep telling me the project was rejected, but in reality, it wasn't rejected until I reach out to someone and tell me, no, it seems it rejected is actually, it's actually good. I said, well, it would be nice if you tell me that, guys. This has been a week. I keep submitting, keep telling me it's rejected, and the whole thing was good. I have no idea. Come on. <laughs> so I had to call them, which they were very good. 
how to respond it. You know, they set the whole thing for you, and then and then you purchase. Because one thing Amazon is very good at is distribution. That's what Amazon was created to do: is distribution. But in my next book, I will not uh, self publish with them because they take so much profit. <laughs> There's nothing really, really left for you. But when I self publish, the beauty about when you self publishing is you can keep a lot of it. But um, again, you could do that and still ask Amazon to to um, uh, to do distribution for you. You're still keeping more really of the of the funding of the money. So we went with we went with, uh, with Amazon. And then there are some other groups. After that, I contact a very a couple of different. Um, um, I think I explored the idea of having an agent. And then there was a couple of them that I was interested as well. The book is already released, but uh, if this book wasn't released, I would be inter- I would definitely be interested in it. So that was very encouraging to hear, even though after a lot of publishing companies that would accept it as first to those big conferences that there were some people saying, well, if it wasn't already publishing, then I would be interested. So so what you need to learn in the process is do a little bit of homework first. Who might be interested in your book before that self-publishing? If there are a few of them that are interested in that process, then you could go You could go with them. Because sometimes what you need is the name of that really publishing company. If that's what you're after, then I would say go that route. But prepare that when you go in that route. The book might be released in two years and three years. But the message we have, we didn't have two, three years to wait. We didn't have that because we're getting close to the 10th anniversary of the earthquake. We want a message that's going to promote the 10th anniversary of the earthquake while we're on the 8th anniversary. That's what, that's what we did. And when we released the book, we also released the book on, on our MLK Day, Martin Luther King Day of Service. That's what we did. So the, a book that embodies service, that creates service, then that was the perfect day to do that. And we were able to meet with a local United Way and a, and a, and a hard, Hallmark insurance company. They purchased the first two, 300 copies of the book right from the bat. They said, here we are, we're nothing. Nobody knows who we are. And then that, right from the bat, we have these guys purchasing 300 copies. So we have the news. And from that point on, it was very, we, we were sitting very, 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 very quickly. But, um, um, that's what it takes for us in the self publishing process. Okay, that's cool. I had no idea that um, Amazon did that, to be honest, which in hindsight is a bit silly because they started with books, so why wouldn't they? It's a huge part of their business. Um, but that's great. It's great that you had a message. You still were able to get it out on your terms, um, and you've done that. Yeah. Um, so, okay, brilliant. Yeah, it's very important. And I, and I will add for our audience, too is um, one thing extra that they have to consider. With everything that's going on in America, I know, especially if you happen to be um, a high melanin um, male in this world, a lot of us really have the implication that the world that's created in front of us is designed to go against us as a really high melanin folks. And, and and the, the reality is, it's, it's, it's the complete opposite. There is certain privilege that you have as a high melanin, and you need to know that to put that into context. You know, as, this, as, the, as the darker skin, it has, there's a lot of privilege that's come with that. I know some of the privilege that come as really a dark, uh, as a, as really a dark skin male, and I really play those privilege to my favor. Because a lot of people, when we're looking at to say, no, the how can you make this happen in the United States as being really a dark male skin? I said, no, in fact, there are so many advantages really for me lay on the table. So I have to really speak to the things that, to the places that's really in my advantage. So story about Haiti is a lot of people really interested about story about Haiti. There's a place that have a compassion that they really want to extend and really, and really help. I, really, I, I spoke to that. And I look into my environment. Now you have a book. You can have someone to write the, the forward for you or the introduction. And as a writer, that, that person can really take your book to the next level. And I remember I had a professor from college who was currently working for the state governor. And she said, if we ever need anything from college, so we to reach out to her. And she knows about the whole process of the book. And in fact, she was the one who made the connection for me to go to Haiti by asking the governor to really work with me. 
So what I had to do is just guy will tell you, go for the ask. So I asked the governor, would you be interested in writing the forward of my book? The next thing I know, we said, yes. Um, um, okay, um, I'll write the forward for you. So you write the forward, send it to me. And I tweak it, send it back to him. Uh, he approved, you know, basically all the tweaks that I did. So now, here I am releasing the book as the very dark scale of the United States with the current state governor being the one who wrote the forward for that book. You know, I basically know what that happened. So you have to see what's around you. And you have to see the place that you went to. If you didn't go to college, if you're working at a, at, at a place in your environment, who can make this contact? If it's, are you in a place that you really have a lot of interactions with a lot of really high profile people? So, well, I work for Fashion House, which was LVMH, one of the biggest fashion house in the world, in the universe. I, I work there because I work at a slow pace uh, environment uh, place where I know that you could hear the uh, the drums in the background. This is all the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that I have a very high clientele there, but I know I can create relationship with my client. And some of them are always asking you know, the passion that you have. And then those clients became friends who actually end up being sponsored to my project, the project I was working on. And I remember a guy say something. I used to say, hey, take a very um, low skill, low skill job, you know, that's not the language he uses, you know, charity. But that job, through that job allow you to spend a lot of time in your phone or a lot of time reading or doing research. You're not getting paid for it, you're not getting a lot of money for it. But will that job allow you to do some kind of really research? And I was at a house where basically when we're busy, when we're busy, when we're not busy, when we're not busy, working for that VMH, that special house where I was doing all my fashion work. Their time was extremely slow. This time enabled me to continue to my brain was keep going. So those things that we were able to do to really help uh, to really help the process the place that, that, I, that I was in. I sacrificed that phase for it. Um, I could, you know, go easily really work for corporate America. But that's not the passion that I have. Because I know that the friends who have really worked for corporate America, they a lot of them are very, very, very uh, miserable. But wherever I was, I was happy. Whatever I was really doing, so it was important for people to know that it can be something very impossible as a dark, as a dark skinned male to accomplish those things living in the United States. But the reality is that a lot of people there willing to really serve you if you know uh, the medium, the format, and really um, how to really ask them really for, um, for 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 a favor. If you can do it, you know, why is it uh, jab 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 hook? Then you'll be able to know. Now, what can you do? What can you do for them? When you really ask for that own favor, make sure that that ask is a very, very big ask, and that create a relationship with me with the governor, and we continue to talk until this day. Um, that I have, you know, he has his, I have his cell phone, I have my cell phones, and we continue this communication and really, really con on, on, on continues. So that really peace happens. So see what's around you, see some of the uh, resources that's around you. And you cannot, if you think you can really do it yourself, as artists, we are terrible at this. We think that we have to create this piece for ourselves. There are so many amazing projects that never finish because people of people of people's ego. Yeah, they don't no, I agree. Yeah, it's true. You know, so kill that, and then you get amazed to see how you'll be able to really put it. So, yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, no, um, I, I completely agree. And... I think that probably is probably a good place to end. Um, so first and foremost, Toussaint, I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. Guys that are listening or watching, um, if you want to follow um, Toussaint, then please check out his Instagram, Superheroes of Service. Um, you can see all about his book and his future uh, books because it is a series, don't forget. So there will be more stuff coming out from Toussaint. Um, and also you can check out his Facebook page, Feel Haiti. Uh, it's up on the screen. Uh, but for those are listening on a podcast, it's P H E E L Haiti H A I T I. Be sure to check them out. Um, so, Toussaint, again, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, you coming on tonight. It's been great. I uh, loved hearing about your journey um, and your book process. It was uh, quite fun, to be honest. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us, everybody who commented, liked, um, and those that you're listening on the podcast. I really appreciate it. 
Um, but I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. So um, to everybody else, I'll see you same time, same place next week with a different guest. Uh, to Toussaint, please join me in since thanks. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>